be a key community anchor as part of the development. And this is what the site uh, looks like today. This is in fact a photograph. The park was officially opened last week. And this is uh, a webcam, a live webcam of the site. And let me see if I can manage the pointer here. I actually can. So those are those two heritage buildings that I showed you. You can see the promenade right here. You can see the trees have already been planted. This is the park that has already been constructed. There's actually another park area here and a park area that connects underneath this uh, expressway into a new housing development here. This is the community center and you can see mid-rise development. This is the next phase of the development that once complete will in fact link the entire site, a complete neighborhood right into the core of the downtown. That site, the West Dawnlands, is also the site for our Pan Am Game Village. And as a result, we've been able to secure provincial and federal monies that have helped with the development of the park, which is also a $40 million stormwater, ma stormwater management and flood mitigation infrastructure component. The second way that we're capitalizing on our massive convergence is through what I've called extreme mixed use. And this is about aggressive integration, about kind of breaking the rules and seeing what in fact happens. So what you see here is the distillery district, which is 13 acres 40 buildings. This is the largest collection of Victorian era architecture in North America. It was built out in the 1860s and at that time was the largest brewery in the world. We're very proud of that. It is also a national historic site, so it's recognized as having national significance. And part of what we've done on this site is we've integrated old and new High and low, there's high-rise buildings as a part of the new development. Historic and adapted uses. This site is an entertainment district, but it's also a university. This site is a theater district, but it's also a place for small-scale entrepreneurialism and a very common wedding venue. But it's very important to know that it's also a neighborhood. And this is one of the reasons why it thrives, because we've integrated the critical mass of density through new residential housing to ensure that there is a population to act and animate this area all days of the week and 24 hours of the day. The third way that we are capitalizing on this convergence is through strategic site-specific infill. Now we call this transforming the tower in the park. Now, you don't actually use this language in Australia, I've learned, but we're talking here about towers, uh, you might recognize them, uh, that are isolated from the street network and isolated from any kind of street life or main street or public amenity. So you can see here what I'm referencing, these towers right here, 1960s. I'd like to say that we just developed this project, realized the errors of our way and stopped, but we didn't in fact. We rather peppered these sites throughout our entire city. These are not an anomaly in Toronto. Every one of those white dots on the screen represents a cluster of towers, over a million people in Toronto live in these towers. So we are a city of high-rise living. We in fact come in ninth in the world for a number of people that live in high-rise buildings. But historically, high-rise has not meant a high quality of life. Many of these buildings were built to be middle-class housing, and within a very short period of time, almost 10 years, they became low-income housing. They became places where there's crime, where there's despair. They are disconnected from any kind of amenities or public transit. So as you can appreciate, we've got a pretty big challenge on our hands. Here's some other examples of the different forms that they take. But in all instances, what unites all of these sites is that the buildings have been disconnected from the streets. So the opportunity for a pedestrian environment is highly compromised. These sites sit in isolation. They are communities without destinations within walking distance, without access to good public transit. 
And so we have this challenge of figuring out how we can use our massive convergence, use the growth that we have to transform these sites into livable, walkable, complete communities. So I'm going to give you an example of how we're doing that. And the example I'm going to give you is called Parkway Forest. And it's important to know that this is a site owned by a private developer. This is private investment. Working in collaboration with the uh, planning division, we've been able to use that private development and massage it in such a way as to transform this community into a fundamentally different place. So just to give you an example of the before and after ground planes, you can see here, this is the before. These are two major highway intersections. So this is really a very isolated site. The only good news here is that we put in a new subway line. This is right along the northern edge of the city in the suburbs, and this is the subway entrance right here. So that was in fact the impetus for the developer to reinvest in the site. And often it takes private sector investment first. The pro sorry, the public sector investment needs to lead and needs to come first. And that's what happened in this incident. incident. So this is the ground floor before, and this is a ground floor after. And what you can see we've done here is some of the buildings have been demolished, but not all. You can see here existing, existing, existing. But here, the buildings have been reoriented to create a street edge and a pedestrian environment. And the buildings have also been reoriented to create meaningful public and pedestrian spaces throughout the site. So this is what we have in our after scenario. This is a rendering. Exist these are existing buildings that you see here. These are six to seven story new buildings that have been added to create some of the pedestrian infrastructure and street life that can link this community into the rest of the city. These, uh, these are rental buildings, new rental buildings in the city. This is a new rental building as well. And through our negotiations with the developer, we have not-for-profit organizations that are getting space along the street edge, as well as cafes and shops and commercial spaces. You can see here interior to the site, a new road that has been created to create a pedestrian environment. This is an existing building. This is a new building. And here's an example of a new public space that has been enhanced as a result of the new development. What's important here was that we needed a fundamentally different built form in order to create usable, meaningful public spaces where there could be active civic life. Now, this is right at the corner of that main intersection, and this is a public art project that in fact is intended to create a sense of identity and to draw the pedestrian into the site. And these beacons, which were created through a design competition and of interest, the artist was Douglas Coupland, uh, the author of Generation X, and the beacons terminate at a new community center and school. How do you get a community center and school on this site? Well, in the past, you didn't because there wasn't enough density. And this is why the density matters so much. We needed the density to create a complete community. We needed the density to ensure that there would be vibrancy and the retail would be something that could, in fact, thrive. So this is an example of the way that we have, in fact, uh, changed towers in the park and are seeking to change many more of our towers in the park as a result of our massive convergence. Now, the fourth way that we're capitalizing on this convergence is through urbanizing our avenues, adding density to our main streets. Now, you can see here, um, this is sort of like everywhere USA. But I've learned that uh, there's a little bit of this in Australia. You've got some of this in Australia too. Uh, these are places to go through. This is the classic road as opposed to the street uh, to draw on the language of the earlier presentation. What we're doing in this context, and you'll recall from the key slide that I showed you that this project, Eglinton Connects, runs right through the heart of the middle of the city. 19 kilometers of LRT are being added to our transportation infrastructure. So you can see that coming down the center of the corridor. We're adding cycling lanes. We're adding widened sidewalk, green trees. Still wouldn't mean anything at this point in its development. 
This is the magic bullet. We're adding mid-rise development, nine stories, to add that critical density that will allow for pedestrian vibrancy and allow the various parts of this corridor to become true community main streets. Uh, this is what it looks like today, another example, and this is what the future will look like. This was approved by City Council approximately a month ago. Most of Council supported it, there were a few councillors who didn't support it, and there were a few people who wanted it to stay a road, who wanted it to be a place to go through. And a critical part of our planning exercise was being able to envision this area of the city as being something fundamentally different from what it is today, being a fundamentally different type of place. Today it's a place you go through, today of course it's a place that you drive through, and in the future it will be a place to be, a place to linger. And getting the movement shifted around, getting people onto LRT, getting people cycling, getting people walking, is a critical part of making it a neighborhood and making it a center for the community. Because right now, a highway can't really be a center of a community. In order to get there, there were a tremendous number of conversations that we had to have with the community about what the future would look like and what it could look like. And in fact, these conversations were critical when there were some councillors who were very concerned over the course of the last month about the proposal. They were concerned about traffic capacity. They were concerned that cars would be slowed down as a result of this new plan. These conversations became a critical part of bringing forward the support from the community for the plan. If we had just gone away and created the plan in a back office somewhere and presented it to City Council, when there were concerns raised about the change and the transformation, we would not have had constituencies who were there to support this future vision. And we were very fortunate that, in fact, the business improvement areas, the businesses along the corridor, various groups, our cycling groups, our residence associations, all came out to say, you know what? I've been there at the table for the past two years, and I support this plan. I believe in this future vision. I believe that it's good for us to turn the city, the future city, into something fundamentally different than what it is today. So let me now move on to our fifth way that we're capitalizing on this massive convergence. And this I've called urbanizing classic suburbs, gentle density and new housing types. So you'll recall this was one, the one that was off to the west side of the slide, Beautiful, green, leafy suburb. These are your best case scenario when it comes to suburbs. Incredibly beautiful places to live. And at the center of this suburb is uh, when it was built back in the 1950s, this was state of the art. This is where it was at, a beautiful green leafy suburb with a plaza in the center. So you could in fact get in your car and drive for just two minutes and you could be at this beautiful strip mall right in the center of your leafy green neighborhood. This was, in fact, the golden ideal at the time that it was built in the 1950s. Uh, this is what it looks like today, and the suburb is indeed uh, very beautiful. You can see it has a really mature tree canopy. Uh, this is the backside of that strip mall, and you can see it has a tremendous amount of surface parking. So if you live here, you know, it's sort of like a four minute walk. But why would you walk? There's no reason to walk to this. And in fact, if you went in a straight line, which you sort of can't, you know, can't really do, but you would end up at the back of the building and there's all that parking, so you might as well just drive. But then again, if you're getting in your car and driving anywhere, why not drive for 10 more minutes and get to a regional mall? So as you can imagine, one of the challenges with this strip mall is that even though it's surrounded by an incredibly affluent community, it has been dying. So we have a plan here, a fundamental plan for transforming this into a community hub. And this is what that plan looks like. And this is about adding a walkable hub, a whole variety of amenities within walking to distance of an existing suburb. It's also about adding housing choice in a neighborhood where that housing choice doesn't currently exist. There's only one type of housing in this neighborhood. And my husband, in fact, grew up in this area, and he has three siblings. And once uh, he and his siblings grew up and moved up, his mom and dad, his mom had lived in this neighborhood her entire life. She was left with her beautiful single-family home with five bedrooms. And she wanted to stay in the neighborhood, but she couldn't. She wanted a, just a small little house. 
She didn't need a great big sprawling house anymore, but it didn't exist in her neighborhood. So this is about adding housing choice. This is also a neighborhood where you must buy. And in fact, this is about adding rental to the community as well. So it's adding a diversity of income types. You'll notice uh, no surface parking. There is parking and the parking is all underground below grade. You'll notice that it looks pretty green and uh, sometimes our renderings do that. They make things look really green. Um, but this is really going to be very green. And the reason it's going to be green is because I told you about before our green roof bylaw. And our green roof bylaw requires all of the roofs to be green. And so many of our developers have become very innovative and have integrated those green roofs into their public spaces as a part of their amenity. So you can see there's a variety of housing types. This is a public square. There's retail that fronts the square. There's also retail on the edges along these edges. Adding the density is critical to making the retail and the commercial work. It wouldn't work without the additional density. The, the density is a critical part of the equation here. And this is what it will look like at grade. The sixth way that we are in fact capitalizing on this massive convergence is we're embracing what we've called the mid-rise city. Now, we have a lot of low density suburbs in our city. You saw all that yellow in the map. And then we also have some very, very tall buildings, particularly in our downtown, but all throughout the city, as you've seen. And we're building lots of new tall buildings. Last week, I approved an 82 and 92 story tower development. We've got lots of really tall buildings in our city. I'm concerned about the livability of those very tall buildings. And I believe that there's an opportunity to transform our low density communities that currently really don't have a lot within walking distance to transform those communities into complete communities by adding mid rise density along our transit corridors that we can add that density to places where it doesn't currently exist in a gentle kind of way so it's not too invasive. And by doing so, we can begin to shift to a fundamentally pedestrian and transit oriented culture in the city. So what does that look like? We have mid-rise being developed all over our city and we have mid-rise guidelines. I'll show you a slide of that in a moment. Uh, every dot that you see is a mid-rise project and you'll notice that almost all of those dots, about 90% of those dots are on our transit corridors. That's exactly where we want them because we want people to move into these corridors and to use transit as their fundamental way of getting around. We have taken land use planning and transit, transit planning and we've gone like this. Our transit plan is our land use plan. Our land use plan is our transit plan. The two are fundamentally and inherently linked and in any city where they're not linked you're probably going to have a pretty significant problem making transit work in the future. We link those two things up very intentionally. So this is a little bit of what that change looks like, adding that density into our main streets, adding some critical mass. This is an example adjacent to a uh, a residential neighborhood that is all suburban. Uh, some of these buildings are a bit too monolithic, they're a bit too large, but they're beginning to introduce a built form that previously wasn't really very acceptable in our, in our suburbs. Here's another example of a recently, these are, these are not renderings, these are buildings that have been, uh, have been recently built. And here's an award-winning project on a corridor. What I'd like you to look at on this corridor is the existing fabric. It's, uh, it's pretty gritty. It's a mix of heritage buildings and Main Street that already exists. And what we're doing is gently inserting these mid-rise buildings to begin adding the density that creates a critical mass that is desirable if we want walkable communities. Part of how we're doing this is by using performance standards. We're very conscious about ensuring that we're creating a great pedestrian realm. So the design of the building responds to the importance of creating a great environment for the pedestrian as well as ensuring that we're not shadowing or creating undue blockages of sunlight for adjacent residences and adjacent neighbors. Now, this is my kind of last point my, uh, in the story of how we are transforming the discourse to transform the city. And 
We're going through a lot of change, and any city that's going through a lot of change will inevitably struggle to get the narrative right, to get the vision right, in order to place the changes that are taking place on the ground into a larger story about the future of the city. And we've had this struggle too. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about um, resistance to change, resistance to four-story buildings in this, in this city and in area, other areas in Australia. I believe that as planners, we have a responsibility to provide access to an understanding of what makes for great places. And we need to connect the dots. We need to connect the dots between the importance of that urban, urban growth boundary and shifting the land economics in a region and creating high quality, sustainable places in higher density neighborhoods. And we can only do that by having meaningful, sustained conversations that involve data and evidence. And one of the things that I've done again and again when we're sitting around the table and there's a very heated conversation take, taking place, take it back to the data and the evidence. Take it back to the facts, the facts that we know about good planning practice and how we create great cities. So a few examples of ways that we're doing this in the Toronto context. We, in fact, just had approved by City Council last week something called Reset TO towards neighborhood planning, which is a fundamentally different planning framework in the Toronto context. We're on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. We're creating regulatory plans through a community based visioning process so that we're generating consensus and then building that consensus into our regulatory framework. This is new and it's very exciting. It means a tremendous amount of upfront work, working with our communities, but I believe it's critical and an essential way to plan. Uh, mentioned in the introduction um, was uh, our chief planner roundtables that we've been hosting in the city of Toronto. We've been hosting roundtables that are about the most critical issues that face our city. And the reason these roundtables matter is because when we get to the very specifics of what's happening on a site, we need to be able to locate that in a larger dialogue about the city that we're trying to create. So in our chief planner roundtables, they always uh, trend nationally on Twitter. We also partner with a local television station, and the local television station has been absolutely shocked at the response that they get in terms of the number of people that watch these roundtables. Uh, we've also had overflow rooms. We've held eight so far for every single one of them. And I should just say that the first roundtable we did, we weren't sure if people would show up or not. We really weren't. And the fact that so many people have taken an interest in talking about large city building issues shows that there is a thirst to participate in the vision making for the future. So we've had round tables on raising children in apartments and condos in urban places. Because we have that boom going on in our downtown, we know children aren't far behind. We have a mini baby boom going on. What does that mean? How do you raise children in condos? We've had a round table about that. Next generation suburbs, resilient city, redefining our main streets. We're trying to address complex issues and have honest conversations by bringing a whole variety of experts into the conversation. We've also gone out into public. Uh, this is an initiative called PIPS. Fondly, PIPS, it's planners in public spaces. My planners have been going out into, into the public spaces where people gather and having conversations about city building. Imagine you're at a festival or an event or you're walking down a pedestrian mall and you see a bunch of people in blue shirts and it says PIPS and they want to talk about city building. What a wonderful way to meet your area city planners. 98% of the people who participated in PIPS last year had never been to a public meeting. We had 20,000 people come to public meetings in 2013. We held over 350 urban design workshops. But 98% of the people we talked to on the streets, they didn't come to meetings. They didn't participate in a workshop. But we connected with them and talked about the future of the city and invited them into our process in new ways. And we believe that's critical for building consensus around how we're going to change our city to make it more sustainable. And the last initiative we have underway is called Growing Conversations, Making Engagement Work. We're reaching out to youth and to the ethnic communities that are underrepresented in our planning processes. 
We're using social media and new ways to engage people who are underrepresented in our planning processes to bring them into the discussion about the future of the city. And I'd like to leave you with one closing thought. As a result of some of our transportation planning, we held consultations on bike. I actually led this consultation last year because we're having a consultation about how we can create new forms of moving people in our city. And in fact, a reporter showed up. Uh, you can see in the heading there, Sun Reporter gets an understanding of cyclists. And in fact, the first sentence reads, I used to hate cyclists. I can admit, as a driver who navigates through the downtown core on a regular basis, I used to curse cyclists whenever they came too close for comfort. But things have changed since I saw the road from a bicycle seat. This is exactly what we're trying to do in transforming our conversations, is to broaden the way we see and understand the city so that we can, in fact, build a city that is sustainable in the future. Thank you very much. Um, on Pierre's behalf, we certainly want to thank uh, Jennifer Kiesma again for uh, coming here and speaking to us um, uh, for the conference and on this very relevant issue. Um, uh, we're pretty much not too badly over time, we're pretty much on time, um, which means that if the audience has any questions, we, we can field some questions still before we close out. Oh, there's a flurry. Perhaps one to Andrew first. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does it work? Uh, I think that the most amazing uh, step in what we've heard was actually sealing the green boundaries. You know? All the discussions that we have, all the attempts to improve our situation will never go further unless we actually seal the boundaries because if the energy of urban development can escape, if you can drink another bottle, there's no reason why you shouldn't. So how did you manage to achieve it? <coughs> Uh, well, that's a great question, and um, let me be very clear because I can't take credit for achieving it. There were many, many, many people uh, who were involved over really about a 10-year period in bringing this policy framework uh, into fruition, and that involved a tremendous amount of negotiation. Uh, it involved getting the land industry on side. It involved getting a whole variety of different municipalities on side. Uh, and it also involved a tremendous amount of public education. And interestingly, uh, there was a lot of polling done to understand what key messages really resonated with the public. And the key message that uh, resonated with the public was not, you may find this shocking, but it was not, let's stop suburban sprawl. Uh, no one really cared about that. But the key message that resonated with the public was around protecting our groundwater. And it was really an environmental message around how critical it was to plan in a fundamentally different way if we were going to be sustainable in the future. So there was a massive amount of public education. That public education continues to this day. You can actually Google ground, uh, greenbelts.ca or Green Belt Foundation, and you'll find that there's a lot of information uh, helping people understand the connection between the green felt belt and the fact that you can eat a locally grown strawberry. Making, you know, connect, making that dotted line so that people go, oh, those two things are connected. So it's not a coincidence that the bringing in of the green belt was linked to the flourishing of local farmers markets. We have over 100 local farmers markets in the city of Toronto where on any given day of the week you can walk down your street and there's a farmers market where you can buy local honey and local eggs all from the region. Connecting that to the green belt is a really important part of helping people understand the way that we are embedded within a larger region, region and how that's critical to our survival. But it wasn't easy. Um, Jennifer, thank you. I think we'll have to leave it there. I'm being told, I'm being instructed that we need to wrap up now. Um, so thank you very much for your time.
Um, I think just in wrapping up, I, I certainly uh, would like to thank uh, all of our speakers, all of our sponsors, and the audience for making this a great event today. Uh, and if, um, if I could possibly suggest a, um, a response to my own question at the beginning of the day, I think some of the ground that's being occupied by placemaking and initiatives there aren't a challenge to planners, but they're possibly laboratories, um, testing, finding out, and our, our mission as planners is to perhaps find how we now then integrate some of those findings into mainstream planning. Um, my last duty is to uh, uh, call upon uh, the uh, Planning Institute WA's uh, president to close our proceedings today. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I've learnt uh, one very important thing as president. Do not stand between planners and a drink. You won't stay president for very long. I, too, would like to thank our speakers. They've been great today. They've made, done a fantastic job uh, and kept largely to time and given us a lot of insight. So I really uh, do thank them. I did have a lot of quotes. I, I love to collect quotes, and I was going to read some. We don't have time. You'll have to look in the e-news, and I'll put some of those best quotes of the day there. Read the e-news, become a planner. Join the planning institutes, the message. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Tremendously important to us. I don't have time to, to read them all. Have a glance down the list of, in the banner, and you can see those sponsors. We are very grateful to them. For this next bit, um, I'd like to draw the winner of the uh, free uh, Congress registration first. Emma's brought it up, so here we go. I've got my card in here, let's hope. <laughs> um, Craig Percy, Planning Officer, uh, Shire of Jeremumgup. Where's Craig? Well done. Now you just have to work on the budget to fly to Melbourne, so it's great. We'll hold on to that. That's great. Uh, the Twitters, or the tweets, I should say, Twitters, tweets. Uh, we had a lot um, come in. Kate Isles, where's Kate? You win the prize, which is nothing, for the most tweets. Well done, tweet. Kate, of course, is our Queensland president. We did actually have some tweets from overseas too, which was, was quite amazing to me as a... Um, complete uh, uh, novice at this sort of thing. Um, we had an uh, honourable men mention for Joshua O'Keefe. Uh, is Joshua here? Joshua uh, tweeted, so in a nutshell, planning is like a game of uh, Sim City and placemaking a game of the Sims. Okay. Uh, is Catherine uh, Howard here? Come up, Catherine. Okay, Catherine's uh, uh, tweet was, some timely news, City of Bayswater not keen on hawkers markets due to parking issues. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Well done. Next, I just want to uh, uh, thank our MC, Peter Clementis. Where's Peter? Come up. We've got a, a lovely bottle of uh, red for you. Thank you very much. What a great job. Thank you. I also uh, want to very much uh, thank our, our state staff, Emma De Jaga. Emma, where are you? There she is. Emma, our great... And also Nav's, Nav's at the back, uh, great from the office, thank you very much. The convener of the conference, Sue Woolhouse, has done a fantastic year, a job over a number of years organising these events. And her helpers, uh, Wob Skorowski, uh, Karina May and Matt uh, Selby on the day, uh, helping out. The study tours, Sue, Rob and Warren Giddens uh, were great. Just want to remind you that uh, what we said at the beginning of the day, our, our 
Planning awards are open for nominations. We need to get those in by the 15th of August, I think the date is. Yes, Emma's nodding. 15th of August. Get those great places in, get those hard-won victory applications in, get them into us. We need those uh, so we can celebrate and go on to win some national awards. We don't want all those awards to be won by Queensland. I'm sick of it, I'm sick of it. So we want to win more awards. Um, finally, I would like to thank you all for coming. It's fantastic, we sold out. So please keep it in mind for next year. Join the Planning Institute, enjoy it, and you put into it and you get a lot out of it. Finally, and most importantly, I'd like to invite you next door to join us for a drink. Thank you all, have a safe trip home, thank you.